Bloop a doop a doo. Bloop a doop a da ba Hey everybody, Michael here. Welcome to my first playthrough review of Final Fantasy VI. You ready to go? Okay, let's get to it. But first, I wanted to remind you of the two videos that we already made on Final Fantasy VI and analysis. Uh, the first is an explanation of my process for this. The second is a quick look at the character themes. You might want to watch those before you watch this one. They're both linked in the description. So now, a spoiler warning. If you did watch my video on analyzing video game music, you'll know that in order to create a super objective for a character, I need to look at their wants over the entire piece. Even though I'm only going to be looking at Act 1 in close detail for this video, I will be looking at the SOs for the characters, so there will be some potential spoilers for the rest of the game too. So I just said Act 1. This game does have an obvious act break after the floating continent, but that really makes Act 1 significantly longer and with significantly more important character moments than Act 2. I personally feel that there's another act break earlier than that, after the battle at Narsh, ending in Terra's first transformation scene. That's what I mean when I say we'll be covering Act 1 today. Another quick name on pronunciations. I got this game when I was 10 years old. This game doesn't have voice acting. If I pronounce something differently from how you pronounce it, let's just chalk that up to a cool quirk of regional pronunciation tendencies and how stubborn some learned ideas can be. We're going to go through this review by important tracks in the music, whether it's the first time you hear the track or it's an important reuse of the track we've already heard. For instance, we're going to start with a track titled Opening. This deals with the opening narration, the conversation between Vix and Wedge on the hillside, and the incredible slow trudge to Narsh. Overall, this game is beautiful graphics and design-wise. I never loved the look of Vector or any of its machinery, though, but I suppose that's intentional. I, it's even more effective with the sepia tint of the opening and with the ominous low chords in the strings building up to disjointed brass fanfares that's slowly calming down to the softer flurries of the woodwinds when we get to the snow-covered cliffside. Then we get the aforementioned slow trudge to the city. The graphics here are so exciting and evocative, but what really amps this up is the music. The martial, repeated rhythms are appropriate for the soldiers marching forward, but the lonely melody fits the desolate, cold fields that they walk through. We see the small, glittering lights of the city slowly rising in the distance, and the music hints that there's more to come. This music is the first instance of Terra's theme, but we only get the A section here. This is also an instance of a theme that comes to an end. It's not built to loop forever, like most versions are. It'll be a little while until we hear the B section of Terra's theme. I'll cover this theme in detail later. Inside Narsh, we're introduced to the battle theme and the victory fanfare. These are the two pieces of music that we hear most often in this game. I'm not planning to cover them, but we hear them so much that I might end up sneaking them in somewhere at some point. What I will say at this point is that it's nice that the baseline of the battle theme is the same across the whole series so far, and the victory fanfare is identical. Next, we get the music for the Minds of Narsh. 8-Bit Music Theory covered this piece of music really well as part of a video on the Locrian mode. Check it out, the link is in the description. Basically, it sounds appropriately dark and suspenseful, like wandering through a mine looking for a strange beast frozen in a block of ice might. We also get our first boss battle, so our first instance of decisive battle. I love the rock organ in this. Then the soldiers reach the frozen Esper. An eerie scene plays out with blue lightning and Vix and Wedge vanishing into thin air. How is this scored? With another world of beasts. This cool track is in a disjointed 7-8 with a harp ostinato outlining the very unusual chord of a minor major seventh. At least it's unusual in European classical music and in Western pop and rock music. It's used more regularly in jazz. Anyway, this theme just kind of floats on with the harp and flute, along with some simple strings, including an incredible bass pizzicato. A more intense B section follows, featuring a higher melody and an almost frantic piano part, while the string's choppy chords turn into long, sustained chords. Interestingly, this theme doesn't just represent the spooky nature of the scene, though that's all we know it for now. As far as I've replayed this game, it 
very specifically references Esper's and their homeworld. After the spooky scene, the young woman wakes up in a bed in an old man's cozy little house. We are about to learn the young woman's name is Tara. We don't know the man's name until much later, but it's Arvis, so I'll just refer to him as Arvis. Tara has somewhat of a two-pronged super objective, but these two ideas are very closely related. To understand herself and her own feelings, and to know love. If you're playing along with me, count all the times that Tara has a line dealing with these ideas. It's a lot. Tara's SO, like most of the playable characters, is really clearly articulated before the final battle of the game, when each character explains why they even have a will to live. There will be more on Tara's SO when I dissect her theme at the end of this video. Arvis is a much less important character. His SO seems to be to further the ambitions of the Returners. He doesn't mention the Returners in this scene, but even helping Terra escape helps the Returners out. Terra isn't useful to them if she's being held captive by the authorities of Narsh. While Terra is dealing with her amnesia and confusion, we hear the track titled Awakening. This is, once again, Terra's theme without a B section. Awakening completely takes out the martial ideas that we heard in the opening. She's not a soldier here, she's just a very confused person. Terra runs into the mines chased by Narsha's soldiers, only to fall and be knocked unconscious. While unconscious, some memories start to come back to her, of who she was, and of how she was treated while she was in Vector. Kafka and Gastal are introduced here. We've already very briefly seen Kafka before we even saw Terra at the beginning of the game. In this sequence, we also see Leo and Celeste, but we don't really get to meet them for a while. Kafka and Gestal have very similar super objectives. Gestal's SO is to obtain the ultimate power so that he can rule everyone and everything. Kafka also wants the ultimate power, but he wants to use that power to destroy, not rule. Kafka and Gestal's main objectives in this flashback lead toward and support their SOs very strongly. Kafka is successfully controlling Terra, who has powerful, innate, magical abilities. Gestal is whipping up the crowd of soldiers, promising them that nothing will stand in their way. The music here fits in well. Lots of martial percussion and an overwhelming sense of dread. The brass suggests a military fanfare, along with a sense of an oppressive, ruling power. The strings support the sense of dread, especially when they get to the high, descending, highly chromatic lines in the B section. We instantly get to learn what kind of person Kafka is, and it's kind of delicious. We don't fully learn his SO until the end of the game, though. Gestal basically tells the crowd his SO in this scene. Back in Arvis' house, we meet the thief, or the treasure hunter, Locke. Locke is initially distrustful of the witch, but Arvis wants to achieve his super objective. He really needs Locke to go help her escape and take her to the king so that the returners can move on to later parts of their plan. Locke's super objective basically comes directly from the last scene of the game. He wants to move on from Rachel and to celebrate life and the living. His theme playing here doesn't completely capture that want, but it does tell us who he is. This is one theme that Molly kind of nailed in our last video on this topic, and that my students tended to do well with. Locke is not the main character, but he thinks he is. He has sort of a fantasy of swooping in and being able to save the day, but that is tied to his inability to save Rachel. Locke's theme is his heroic mask that helps him not deal with the past and helps him prevent more trouble in the future. So Locke gets to save the day, along with the help of some Moogles. Locke pledges to protect Terra, his mask showing once again. It's some great foreshadowing that Locke freaks out so much when Terra says that she's lost her memory. Terra tends to be pretty distrustful of people being nice to her. Here, that shows as her just blinking a bunch of times, but she gets more open about those feelings later. Figaro Castle is an impressive looking place. It has a pleasing symmetry to it. The people here talk of the castle as a manufacturing hub. It's interesting to see this world discussed as if it has an actual economy. A favorite piece of flavor, if you talk to the thieves in the jail, they'll complain that the king wasted his time locking them up when there are far worse dangers going by unchecked outside of the jail. Sounds familiar, 
almost like real life. No one in the castle can really agree whether Figaro and the Empire are allies or not. If you add these pieces of flavor text to the first actual meeting you have with Edgar, he seems somewhat unlikable. When he meets Terra, he basically gives her a full body once over, and he turns to walk away from her. Terra, in a moment of honesty and bravery, calls him out. When he offers to help her out, she retorts, Why are you helping me? Paying closer attention to her text is making me like Terra way more in this playthrough than I already did before. When she's left alone, she does start to doubt herself, though. If we're basing every playable character's super objective on their lines before the final battle of the game, Edgar's SO is to build a kingdom in which he can guarantee freedom and dignity. This might be the only SO that we don't know the result of. After the game is finished, does he achieve that goal? He certainly has some growing up to do before he can do that. For instance, it's clear that Edgar is a womanizer. One person in the castle says he hit on the High Priestess. Side note, there are High Priestesses in this world? We never get to meet anyone connected to religion at all, as far as I can remember. People often accuse Edgar of hitting on underage girls. It's a lot worse in later translations of the game, and I gather it's worse in Japanese. I'm choosing to believe that the Super Nintendo translation that I'm using, which is a little bit tamer, is canon. For instance, the little girl in the castle says that Edgar promised he'd marry her when she got older. This could be read as just playing make-believe and the girl takes it too seriously. It's still a little weird, but it's worse in other translations. Throughout his first scene, and really through many of his scenes, Edgar seems more utilitarian to the plot than to seeking out his SO. It's partially because his SO is kind of outside of the events of the game but he is often the one suggesting to the party what they should do next. In a way, this is leading toward peace for the world, which would definitely improve the lives of his subjects. Edgar's theme, which he shares with Sabin, seems similarly utilitarian. It feels more like the theme for Figaro Castle than it does for its king and his brother. It's a standard fanfare-like castle theme. The interesting part comes in the theme's softer B section, which is where the emotional core of the theme is. This emotional core is explored much more directly in the coin song, which we hear when the matron is introducing Sabin. The coin song, which is much more important in Act 2, is just the B section of the Edgar and Sabin theme, slowed down and stripped bare. Sabin's super objective is to reconnect with his brother. In this flashback, we see the cracks starting to form in their relationship. When you speak to the Chancellor later, he speaks of a coin toss. This too will be elaborated on in Act 2. Edgar is informed that someone from the Empire is here to meet with him. He assumes, probably Kafka. The music we hear proves him right. Kafka's theme is a perfect description of his personality. It seems silly, frivolous, and lilting, but upon a deeper listen, there are unsettling rumbles from the timpani, jarring erratic twists in the melody, and sudden shifts in the dynamics. Kefka is someone who should not be trusted. The little scene of Kefka walking through the desert, complaining that there is sand on his boots, is also such a good way to tell the audience who he is. So is his laugh. It seems a little silly now, but for 1994, that laugh is iconic and menacing. Kefka comes to find Tara, but Edgar successfully runs him off, for now. In her guest room, Tara and Locke discuss what's really going on. Tara's looking for some guidance that Locke can't give, but he does come right out and confirm what the audience was probably guessing. Figaro is not an ally to the Empire, they're working with the Returners. Before the lights even come up on the scene the next morning, the sound of the theme for the Empire alerts us that something is wrong. In this case, it works like a classic light motif. It tells us specifically that the Empire has done something bad, even before the characters know. Kefka has set fire to Figaro Castle, even though it seems to be almost entirely stone, so not sure how that stone is burning. Kefka gloats to Edgar's face, and the two soldiers with him do their best Beavis and Butthead impressions. But Edgar has a plan. The music switches to something heroic. Locke's theme? It seems like Edgar did all the work here, but sure, let's play Locke's theme. Edgar, Tara, and Locke get away safely, 
and the castle shockingly closes in on itself and it submerges beneath the sand, smothering the flames. In the boss fight with two Magitek armored soldiers that follows, most players would have Terra cast fire on the enemies, which would make Edgar freak out to see the magic. Well, I accidentally killed the boss before Terra could cast fire. The auto crossbow is powerful, and I was worried I'd missed the scene. No worries, the scene triggers whenever Edgar does see Terra cast magic. I love the scene on Chocobos after the battle. Terra's looking for some reassurance. Edgar and Locke successfully convince her to come with them to meet Bannon. Along the way though, Edgar accidentally insults Terra by insinuating that she's not human. Her Chocobo comes to a stop. Edgar and Locke have some really pleasant looking choreography on their Chocobos while the track Awakening plays. Edgar has struck a bit of a blow to part of Terra's SO, her need to connect and fit in. And the physical action and sad version of Terra's theme help to make that all click, even if subconsciously. The party makes their way through the cave, which plays the Phantom Forest theme, more on that later. I'll just say that it does fit here, but it does fit there better. Once you leave the cave, you hear the real world map theme for the first time. Terra's theme in its fullest form, including the B section. A full, deep dive into this theme will be at the end of this video. When the party arrives in South Vigro, you hear Kids Run Through the City, which is basically the perfect JRPG town theme in my opinion. You also see Shadow walking away. Who is that interesting looking guy? Let's follow him to the pub. Inside, you hear Shadow's theme. It heavily features a jaw harp, a simply strummed guitar, and a whistle. The music seems to call to mind a lonesome cowboy, but Shadow is a ninja. The two archetypes are very similar though. They both typically live solitary lives, cut off from others, and often from their own emotions. We don't know much about him yet, but Shadow's super objective is to make peace with his past. As you explore South Figaro, you can put together that the richest man in town is up to no good. There will be more on that story later. Other people in town are afraid of impending war. You also learn that Master Duncan took his disciples to the mountains for training. Visiting an empty home outside of town, Edgar sees signs that Sabin was there. They run across another man who says that Sabin, when he heard that Master Duncan was slain, headed into the mountains after them. We're headed that way anyway to get to the Returner's hideout, so let's head to Mount Colts. I don't have much to say about the Mount Colts theme other than that it's a bop, and I love when the organ comes in. Mount Colts itself is a cool looking place. I especially love how the bridges look here. It's fun that there are so many hidden passages leading to treasure. It really pays to explore this place fully. Eventually, the party runs across Vargas, who was shadowing them earlier, even though that was absolutely Sabin's silhouette, right? He assumes that Sabin sent the party after him, so he wants to get rid of them. During the fight, we hear the chaotic track, The Unforgiven. Sabin runs up to help the party defeat Vargas. After the battle, Edgar explains to Sabin that they're working on a way to strike back at the Empire. Sabin offers to join the party, and Edgar seems genuinely touched at that thought. Sabin's SO is already on the way to being completed. My favorite moment, though, is Tara's interaction with Sabin. She says, younger brother? At first glance, I thought he was some bodybuilder who had strayed from his gym. Like, damn, she just says whatever's on her mind, doesn't she? Sabin, ever the good-natured himbo, says, I'll take that as a compliment. Shortly after, he asks, think a bear like me could help you in your fight? Confirmed, Sabin is gay and he's my husband. The party makes their way to the Returner's hideout to meet with Bannon. And can I just say, he's kind of a jerk. His super objective is to take down the Empire, and in most of his interactions, it seems he doesn't really care how that happens or who he uses to make that happen. He also doesn't have the best emotional intelligence, pointing out the rumor that Terra killed 50 people in mere minutes. Locke and Edgar stand up for her, and Bannon tries to walk it back, but not very successfully. It still ultimately sounds like he wants something from her. Terra's blocking throughout this scene is surprisingly effective at showing her emotional state. After the scene, Locke, Edgar, and Sabin weigh in on the situation. It's good of Edgar to point out that they shouldn't be forcing Terra into anything. Sabin vouches for Edgar in just about the cutest way ever. Locke tells Terra that someone important to him was jailed by the Empire. Is this a lie about Rachel, or is this someone else pre-Rachel? Either way, Locke tries to reassure Terra by telling her that people care about her. Terra then gives her answer to Bannon. While it's possible to tell Bannon that she won't help him, 
and it might even be a better deal because you get a better relic out of it. I said yes this time so that I could get the longer scene at the hideout. Bannon calls a meeting to discuss their next plans. Everyone agrees that Magitek power must be coming from Espers. Why else would the Empire be so concerned with the frozen Esper and Narsh? In the stories from the War of the Magi 1000 years ago, humans used magic that was drained from Espers. Bannon asserts that the Returners must fight back with Magitek power of their own, even though he assumes it's drained from Espers. Bannon will stop at nothing to achieve his goals. Locke and Sabin are lone dissenting voices. Locke wants to make sure Terra is okay, and Sabin is shocked that it seems as if the rest of the room is enjoying this. Throughout much of our time in the hideout, we've heard the track Returners. First off, it's another Bob. I love the way that the melody and the harmony aren't doing exactly the same thing, but they're working together to achieve a melodic goal. I don't love the B section as much. I think the chords change too rapidly, and this reminds me of how erratic Kafka's theme is, but perhaps this is describing Bannon in some way. I think it was probably not intentional on Uematsu's part, but this could be drawing some shade of parallels between Bannon and Kafka. We hear a thud. The music changes to The Empire Gestal, working like a classical leitmotif again. The music has told us that the Empire has done something bad. Now, Edgar takes over the discussion. Locke will sneak into South Figaro for reconnaissance and to slow the Empire down. Everyone else will go back to Narsh, down the Lee River. Edgar takes charge to efficiently accomplish his goals, which will lead toward him successfully completing his super objective. Locke has one last line where he's looking out for Terra before he leaves. Can I just say that I think the Lee River section is weird? And not really in a good way. The character of Ultros kind of makes no sense to me. He has a permanent vendetta against the party, even if potentially nobody you have with you during later interactions was on the raft during this first meeting. After you defeat Ultros, you see the first instance of Sabin behaving completely irrationally, all set to one of the best tracks in the game, What? Side note. This scene taught me the word zealous. I love the little mechanic introduced here of being able to decide which scenario you want to handle first. I personally like to handle the Terra, Edgar, and Bannon scenario first. I find it really interesting that the guards recognize Terra, so they don't let the party in. I wonder why they don't try to apprehend her, though. Strange tangent, but that just made me think of something else. After Terra wakes up in Narsh at the beginning of the game, the guards demand that she and the Magitek armor be turned over. We know what happened to Terra, but what happened to the armor? My guess is that Arvis handed it over to Bannon, because we know Bannon's at any cost mentality. Anyway, it's cute that Terra remembers Locke's secret entrance to the mines. If you go one route through the mines, you'll come across the Mughal cave and hear Mog's theme. This theme is so cute, I love it. The discussion between the party and Arvis isn't that notable, so let's just move on so we can meet my favorite character. The sequence with Locke alone in South Figaro is one of my favorites in the game. South Figaro feels so different, and a big part of that is because we hear the new track under martial law instead of kids run through the city. It's tense, bleak, and run-down sounding. Seeing the occupying soldiers all over the streets really seals that deal. To get around the town, Locke needs to use secret passageways and to access areas only open to merchants or soldiers by stealing the clothes right off people's backs. People in the town complain that the soldiers are quick to fight, but Locke will start a fight with you just for calling him a thief. Locke eventually makes his way to the house of the richest man in town, who feels appropriately bad that he sold out his town. Listen for the draft in his room, or no, the huge gale coming from behind his bookshelf. In the basement, we meet Celeste, the former general of the Empire, now sentenced to execution for speaking out against the Empire's cruelty. When we meet her, we don't hear her theme as we have with every other character so far. This was not an accidental oversight. On the one hand, it would be odd to hear Celeste's beautiful theme while the soldiers are beating her and she's chained to the wall. But even more than that, she doesn't have her theme yet. Celeste's super objective is to be accepted for who she is, but you would never guess that from early scenes with her. Really, from how she behaves in the entire first act. Typically, she's trying to project an image of being tough and independent. 
Another tangent, this basement is confusing. There are so many hidden passages that I couldn't find my way through when I was playing this for the first time as a kid. Celeste and Locke had leveled up so much by the time I got out of there. It makes sense that the basement is confusing though. For one thing, from a gameplay standpoint, if you figure out all the secrets of the basement, you can get the game's first ribbon, which is a pretty good deal. But on the other hand, if I had two separate secret dungeons underneath my basement in my house, I'd want to keep them hidden too. Locke and Celeste escape to Narsh, so let's just turn our attention to Sabin, who fell off the raft a while back. He washes up near an odd man's house, where Shadow just happens to be standing. Shadow offers to accompany Sabin, but I have no idea why. The pair make their way to the Imperial base near Doma Castle. They hide while they overhear various goings-on in the camp. Amusingly, all the soldiers seem to hate Kefka. Whenever we see the activity at the camp, we hear the track Troops March On. This is the same melody as the Empire Gestal, so it carries many of the same connotations. A few alterations change the mood here though. Most importantly, it's faster. But it is actually reorchestrated too. It still features a lot of percussion, brass, and strings, but the brass is higher and brighter, and there's much less in the low end from the strings. And we have a lot more of a driving, snare-led percussion instead of the ominous, thundering timpani. This is less about the dread of the Empire, and more about the bustle of an actual military campaign. Contrast that with the theme of our next character, Cyan. Cyan is the best soldier of Doma, an older, more established, calm-demeanored, noble warrior. As Molly pointed out in our last video, this theme seems to incorporate more specifically Eastern influences than many others. This theme describes Cyan's typical personality excellently, but it doesn't quite capture his super objective, because he hasn't started on that objective yet. He will soon, though. Back at the camp, we meet General Leo. His super objective is to live honorably. The soldiers seem to worship him. He is called back to the capital by the Emperor, so Kefka is left in charge. Leo tries to convince Kefka to not do anything cruel while he's gone, but we all know Kefka doesn't listen to him. Even though the party tries to stop him, Kefka poisons the river that is the water source for Doma Castle. Kefka's theme playing through this feels especially sick and twisted. So how does this poison actually work? Do Cyan and the other sentry just never drink water? Is that how they survive? Or do you just have to inhale fumes coming from the river? If that's the case, they do come down near the river there eventually, but they seem to be fine. I don't know, I've always wondered this. Cyan discovers the dying king of Doma. He then, in silence, finds his wife also dead. He goes to the bed to check on his son, whose lifeless body gruesomely falls to the floor. Cyan has received his super objective, to overcome the loss of his family. His first response to the tragedy is to break character, fly into a rage, and attack the Imperial base all by himself. The Unforgiven plays. A few things happen here. Sabin and Shadow help Cyan out, so the three of them can escape the base together. At one point, Sabin suggests that they get into some empty Magitek armor, which sets up a minor characteristic for Cyan. He's awkward with machinery. It's a plot point that I don't think is done particularly well at any point in the game. One thing about the Magitek armor, though. Our Magitek armor can one-shot the enemy Magitek armor, but theirs can't do the same to us. Are we using some ultra-powerful new Magitek? I also need to bring up that Cyan also speaks in a quasi-Shakespearean Middle English. I don't mind that for the character, I think it makes sense, but if you're gonna do it, you have to do it right. Two examples from this scene. One, thank you whomever you are. Nope, that's just whoever. And two, Sir Sabin, it is I who is in your debt. Why would you structure a sentence that way? It's technically not wrong, it's just so awkward, and it seems to be awkward only for formality's sake. After the party escapes the base, they make their way to the Phantom Forest. We've heard the theme here before in the Cave to South Figaro, but it's, it fits better here. The ooh, uh, ooh, <laughs> synth in the back sounds almost haunting, and the flute melody is beautiful and ethereal. The forest itself looks beautiful, the rendered backgrounds are especially great. It is a bit tough to tell where the exits are on the screen though. I just remembered my way through from playing this as a child. After going through the forest, the party gets on a train that's mysteriously sitting there. It turns out to be the Phantom Train, which ferries passengers to the other side. 
Sabin is anxious to get off the train, but Cyan almost accepts his fate, perhaps another coping mechanism related to his SO. The Phantom Train's song feels appropriately monotonous, but also threatening and also whimsical. Of course, the train sequence ends with a fight with the train itself. Yes, Sabin can suplex the train, and it's just something you have to do. I mean, I don't make the rules, you have to do it. But after that, why not end the fight early with a phoenix down? Work smarter, not harder. After the party gets off the train, Cyan sees his wife and son board. As the train leaves, they implore him to move on, but he can't quite yet. Following this, Cyan stands on the train platform in silence. Sabin can wander the platform, but overall you just have to wait in silence. This is one of the best musical choices in the game in that there is no music. It's very similar to Galif's death in Final Fantasy V. You just have to stew in your feelings. To move forward, the party has to leap over Baron Falls because cool action sequence. I do like that Shadow just says nope and leaves here, but Sabin, when he's saying goodbye, is such a sweet guy. I'm so glad he's my husband. Sabin and Cyan wash ashore after leaping over the falls. A strange boy, Gao, finds them. As Molly and I discussed in the last video, Gao's theme sounds way too mature to be a theme for a child, but it is appropriately lonely sounding for a boy who was disowned by his father and then was raised by wolves. Otherwise though, this isn't my favorite theme. At least it does have one bar of 3-4 in a track that is otherwise in 4-4. Four, four. That's cool, I guess. After Gao leaves, Sabin and Cyan are free to explore the Veldt. I love how wildernessy it looks and feels. There are no edges here, it's just unending flat land. There are no edges to the music, even. It does not cut to the battle theme when you get in a fight, and we hear no victory fanfare here. Wild West plays the whole time. It's kind of a cool theme, but it feels a little bit like appropriation. I don't know. I don't know enough to really weigh in on this too much. I love the soldier side quest in Mobley's. It's so sweet that you can send letters to Lola and Miranda for the wounded soldier. It's even more impressive that the story continues in Acts 2 and 3. Once you recruit Gao, you learn a bit more about him. He's food motivated, he's strong, and he didn't learn proper speech. I think the most telling part about this scene, though, is how Gao reacts when he sees that Cyan is upset. This ties into Gao's super objective, to have people who care about him. He never had the care he needed as a younger child, so he definitely doesn't want to alienate anyone now. I love the tutorial for Gao's leap and rage skills. The imp is so cute, and the spinach rag that plays during the tutorial is also adorable. The Serpent Trench sequence is honestly not at all noteworthy from a storytelling perspective, but the music is cool. The party makes their way to Nikea, and then takes a ferry to South Figaro. Everyone meets back at Narsh. The heroes slowly trickle into the Elder's house for a meeting. Bannon and Arvis are trying to convince the Elder to allow Narsh to join the cause, and of course Bannon is kind of a jerk about it. When Cyan and Celeste meet is when things get interesting. Cyan says a line that I never really hear anyone talking about when they're talking about Celeste's character. This is General Celeste. She torched Miranda. She's an Imperial spy. Cyan is prepared to kill her on the spot, but the important part here, I think, is she torched Miranda. We know that Celeste was an Imperial general, so we assume that she did some bad things, but now we know exactly what one of the things she did was. Celeste doesn't get to speak for herself at this point, though. Locke swoops in and protects her instead. Next, we get a little sequence that focuses on Celeste. First, Edgar warns Celeste about Locke's troubled past. She retorts by, once again, appearing tough and independent. Celeste talks with Terra about the gift of magic. Terra takes this as an in to talk about feeling included and knowing love. Celeste once again brushes this off. The lady doth protest too much, methinks. The scene works so well to support Terra's SO and to show Celeste acting tough. Finally, Cyan tells Celeste that he doesn't trust her and she's like, lol, okay. The music during the battle scene is fun. Kafka is excited for the opportunity to kill Celeste, but the really fun stuff happens after the battle. The party crowds around the frozen Esper, which has been moved to the hills above the town. There's definitely some connection between Terra and the Esper, and Celeste can feel the Esper's mind. Terra demands answers from the Esper. As magic power flies all around, 
Edgar tries to calm Terra and have her move away from the Esper. Another world of beasts plays in the background to highlight the magic of this frozen Esper. Then, Terra transforms into a monster herself, and with an excellent scream sound effect, flies off to the west. Blackout. End of Act 1. Okay, I know this video is really long already, but I want to go into a quick deeper analysis of Terra's theme and look at how it really explains her character and even her super objective. Molly said that Terra's theme made her think, this is a serious character, this is a heroic character, this is a fighter but only when necessary, pastoral parental figure, best friend, is this the hero? Is this THE hero? No, the romantic lead would be the hero. And I don't know what to make of this honestly, it's all over the place. Some things I want to point out. The A section is very simple. It consists mostly of a small idea. Let's call that X. That is transposed between the minor tonic and the relative major mediant. We get some sort of militaristic drive in the rhythm of the snare drum and the bass. It's incessant in a way that invokes both a march, but also Ravel's bolero. This adds to what Molly was saying about the theme, heroic, a fighter, but only when necessary. There's still some reserve to it though. Terra doesn't go looking for a fight. There's warmth in the background from the strings. They feel sad, but also somewhat comforting. To my ears, the banjo is just there for texture. The solo flute-like instrument sounds lovely. It stands out from the other instruments in range and timbre, but it is also hopeful in the sections that are in the major key. The solo instrument doesn't fit in, but it can lead. More hope comes in during the major sections with the heroic horns. In the B section, we abandon the X motive and we just focus on the horns and strings. This is the most hopeful and heroic portion of the theme. I could go through and label chords and non-harmonic tones here, but I don't think that would be particularly effective. Besides, this video is long enough as it is. Anyway, thanks for watching this video. Let me know what you think. Did I miss any important character moments? Did you read something in a different way? Does a different translation of a section completely change how the scene can be read? Did you make any connections that I missed? Let me know in the comments. Please give this video a like if you liked it, please subscribe if you're not subscribed already, and please join me for the discussion of Act 2 at some point. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, when I say the end of Act 2, I mean the end of the floating continent. Thanks again everybody, and maintain your groovy selves.